Okay, so now we're heading into chapter three of uh, Griffin's book on human rights, and we're looking at when human rights uh, conflict. Now, Griffin says, and just takes it as a, as a given that, you know, to best uh, understand human rights, that is to get really underneath and understand the theory of human rights that someone is proposing. Um, you, you should look at when they conflict, right? So that's his central idea is what do we do when they conflict? And uh, why look at uh, the conflict? Well, he kind of picks up on an old theme. Um, it's been around since antiquity, for instance, uh, and it, you can find it in Thucydides, the great uh, Athenian general who wrote a book on the Peloponnesian War. And he said, if you really want to know uh, something about uh, human beings, look at them in times of war, for it is in times of conflict that uh, we really get to truth, right? You know, and we kind of do that, right? You know, when people are in rough situations, serious situations, and the actions that they take, the things that they say, we often say, aha, now I know uh, uh, who you really are because I've seen you under stress. I mean, that's debatable whether that's always good to, to, to put people under stress and say, yeah, yeah, that's where we've revealed it. Is, is it always good to stress a theory uh, to find out what the theory really says? Uh, you, you could you could debate that, but anyways, so keep in mind that shall we say that's the that's the 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 idea that's running in the software in the background is that it is through read these conflicts of human rights that we're going to get a good grasp of what a human rights theory is about. Now, and Griffin is he's in the human rights game and he's putting forward a kind of theory based on personhood, and so he's going to look at stressing uh, 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 you know this sort of idea of of human rights in the context of a common measure of personhood. But that's getting a little ahead of the game. So um, as I said, in terms of stressing and a common measure, just think of when you're trying to compare and contrast things in very simple uh, uh, ways. So that is, um, if you wanna compare and contrast, or if you wanna compare, for example, uh, which one's heavier, something simple, like let's take a very concrete example, like which one's heavier, a, a, a pineapple or an apple, right? Well, it, you don't argue about it. You you have a common measure, right? And that common measure is uh, going to be what 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 physicists would call would call a weight. And a weight is going to be unpacked in terms of a gravitational field and mass, blah blah blah. But that's not really important. The the, the thing is is that there's a common measure. So when you've got two things. Uh, you have to find something common between them to compare so that you convert something about them into that common measure and that this has so much of the common measure, this has so much of the common measure, and then you can look. So this, the apple weighs so much, the pineapple weighs so much, and you can compare the numbers. So you need a common measure. So in terms of, of, of our story here, well, there's, there's no real difference. If, if one human right, so, you know, I just human rights subscript one clashes with a, a different human right uh, subscript two, uh, we need a common measurement and that's going to be personhood. And where it gets a little bit more abstract is, you know, it's easy You just throw things on a scale when you're dealing with uh, pineapples and apples. Um, but here now we have to be a little bit more subtle. We have to do a philosophical analysis of, and it goes something like this. Well, with respect to personhood, um, you have HR1 and HR2. Which one, HR1 or HR2, is better at valuing personhood? Which is better for uh, valuing personhood? And you might be thinking, well, I don't know, what, it, what does it mean to value personhood? That's a good question because, um, you know, we do uh, uh, often disagree uh, on, on certain things. Uh, we, like we might agree that, you know, you, you value human rights. Um, and let's say you're out protesting and doing all kinds of things and you're, you're active and you're writing papers, you're marching, you're doing all kinds of stuff. And you say, that's how I express my valuing of human rights. And maybe another person doesn't do all that. Um, and they, they, they do different things. I don't know, maybe they just talk about it or maybe they, maybe they watch TV, but they still want to claim that they uh, value uh, human rights. So this notion of valuing something, right? That's not entirely clear. Right. So and, and because that's uh, not entirely clear, you have to give some kind of explanation or some kind of articulation of what it means to value something. So this notion of 
uh, this question, which I've marked with a little asterisk, which one is better at valuing personhood? If you, Griffin says, if you ask that question, you're, you're really asking a question that takes you deep into the heart of what he says normative ethics is all about. Now, remember, normative ethics is one kind of ethics uh, and it's one kind of sort of general orientation on ethics. So there's three kinds of levels. And you can dig deep into this, philosophers certainly have. There's sort of the, the, the bare bones anthropological level of uh, uh, descriptive ethics where you're just describing, right, what, what people say and do in terms of ethics. And you're not making any evaluations. You're just doing descriptive ethics. And that's what a lot of people who study cultures and things like that, they do descriptive ethics. It's not what we're doing here. Then there's meta ethics, which is a totally different game. Um, and that's looking at how meaning is ascribed, not what meanings, but how meaning is ascribed to ethical propositions. We're not quite doing that. We're kind of in the middle with normative ethics. So answering the question of the common measurement in terms of ethics is saying which one values personhood more. That's the normative. That's the heart of normative ethics. And there's two general orientations you can take on normative ethics, and that is a deontological stand or a teleological stand. So deontological is sort of the, the, a very kind of abstract, the, the notion of looking at what is the right thing to do in and of itself, you can think of it that way. Um, and teleological is saying, no, 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 we don't just look at the right in and of itself, we look at, at, at some kind of good that we want to produce. Right. Some kind of, you know, whether it's kind of in a virtue theory of like kind of like, oh, well, I want to be a happy person. So here are the virtues that I learn uh, like skills so that I can be happy or same thing. Another branch of uh, or species, if you like, of the genus teleological ethics. No, 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 not 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 that virtue stuff. That's one species. But I'm more of a consequentialist. Uh, in, the, in the large sense of, of bringing about uh, certain goals. So my, 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 my approach is to look at, at results. And, but both of these teleological approaches are, as the term teleology suggests, having a telos or a goal of some kind. Whereas um, deontology, no, no, it's not a goal of some time. It's, it's not like that, right? Um, so let's uh, uh, look at this to maybe unpack this a little bit more and keep in mind our central question is uh, how do we uh, start talking about a common measurement personhood well we're talking about it in terms of value so teleology and deontology differ on how to value something right so let's take a really simple example um, and this, again, this is kind of running in the back of this whole discussion in chapter three of uh, the conflict of, of human rights. And just to give you a hint, uh, what uh, Griffin, and he's, he's basically said this already, he's looking at a kind of teleological approach because teleological approaches do allow us to trade things off, which deontological approaches really don't. And, and Griffin does want to have a high value. He wants to value human rights very highly, but not to the point where you can't trade them off in any way, which is what happens under a strict uh, deontological approach. But even there, you gotta be a little bit careful. But all right, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but let's just keep uh, uh, plowing ahead. So let's consider this question about valuing um, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different concrete example. Suppose you value honesty. And I think most, hey, isn't it the best policy? So let's say you value honesty and you're in a situation, and we've been in these kinds of situations. Think about whistleblowing situations, right? Where um, you're in a situation where being honest, if someone says, no, tell the truth, fess up, or tell the truth, to, or when power says, speak truth to us, you're in a situation, for the sake of discussion, um, it, where being honest will get you basically punished publicly, right? So, um, and a lot of people, as I said, you know, think that whistleblowers are in that position. Now, yeah, if you are honest and you tell the truth in many systems. Well, look out, you, you, could pay, you could pay a serious price and the price is public. You will be publicly punished. Now, that's, uh, again, I, I just want to set this up so I keep in mind, talking about how we can value things. So what we're doing is we're unpacking the notion of valuing honesty. And there's different ways to do it. Okay, so 
yeah, I could get pun published, uh, uh, published. I could get punished publicly. Whoops. Um, this will discourage others from telling the truth. So just for the sake of discussion, that's the situation you're in. In other words, what happens when people see someone pun uh, published, punished for publicly uh, telling the truth and they're punished publicly, this could actually have the, the consequence of fewer people being willing to come forward. I, I'm not going to, I know that something's going wrong here, but I'm not coming forward because if I do, look what happened to that guy that did. I don't want that to happen to me. So that could lead to less honesty, right? Fewer people coming forward and being honest. People will just be quiet, right? So it could lead to less honesty in the world. Now, you might say, you won't hold at the same time that, um, you know, I still value honesty, um, but I'm not going to, to come forward and, and get into trouble about it. Or would you want to say, no, nah, you don't value it at all. So this has caused philosophers to think about this. But, you know, let's let's think about this in, in a sense like, is it the case that you're really valuing honesty by coming forward and you lead and your behavior actually leads to fewer people being honest? Yeah, you were honest. Well, good for you. But the result was fewer people will be honest because of what you did, right? Where this this gets a bit uh, a, a bit uh, a bit shall we say a little bit taxing to, to to think about because we have to think about it from a couple of different angles. So let's let's just start with this. Okay, so you got this situation. What's the right thing to do? What do you do? And and I put this in like what is the right thing to do? Well, you might want to just say look. You should act honestly, tell the truth, speak truth to power, you know, kind of like your grandma said, always be truth, truthful. Kant said, tell the truth, right? The ontologist, right? Tell the truth. Don't lie. You do, you know, yeah, that's what we do. That's the, that it, the right thing to do is independent of the, of the consequences. So um, in that sense, the right is independent of the consequence, independent of any good, right? If, if bad stuff comes about, you still did the right thing. There's lots of people that would stand and, and just say, look, tell the truth. That's the right thing to do. And whatever the, let the chips fall where they may, right? You can say you were honest and you did the right thing, right? But remember, um, you're claiming that the right is independent of the good. Like you are stating, right? You're, 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 position is that the right is independent of the good. It's not, it doesn't diminish the right. I'm not diminishing or devaluing honesty in any way by being honest and letting the chips fall where they may. So, so again, act to, to value. Now, what are we doing? The right thing to do is to value honesty. And by valuing honesty is to act honestly. I'm instantiating honesty. And in that sense, um, um, what we're what we're saying is that I'm valuing honesty for its own sake. So in this first deontological position, I'm saying that the right thing to do is independent of everything else. Valuing honesty means instantiating it, right? I act honestly. That's how valuing honesty should work, right? So you're unpacking valuing honesty in terms of you always instantiate it. Whatever happens, you instantiate it. That's what it means to truly value honesty. Now, my valuing of honesty doesn't, uh, 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 you know, doesn't create honesty's value. Honesty has a value in and of itself, right? I'm not creating it or in, in any way. I'm just recognizing its value and instantiating uh, and respecting and val my valuing of its value is to act so that I instantiate it. And so the value of honesty is completely independent of my action. That's not bringing anything about or whatever. Honesty is not some good that we just want to bring about in the world. We recognize it as intrinsically good. It's not a worldly type good. So it's a little bit misleading to call it like a policy or whatever. The uh, the true deontological position is much more formal and much more abstract than that, right? Kant doesn't tell you to tell the truth because this is, again, this is important. So a little side note. Don't ever think that Kant is telling you to be honest because that's a good way to be with your others, with your fellow citizens. And that leads to a better uh, uh, situation because that would be consequentialism. That would be say being honest is the best policy because that has the best results, not deontology. That's a consequentialist line of thinking. 
That's fine, but don't think that's a deontological line. Kant is much, much more formal and abstract than that. So honesty is not a good to be brought about, right? You value it for its own sake, right? You're not trying to bring it about or whatever. You're just it's trying to instantiate it. Um, and if, 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 now you can say this as a deontologist, look, if I stand up and tell the truth, um, and if it has negative consequences, well, so be it. But if it has positive consequences, I could be happy about that. I could be unhappy about standing. I could be a deont I could be the unhappy deontologist and say, um, I'm going to stand up and tell the truth. That's the right thing to do. I'm unhappy that that will cause, uh, that could very well cause less honesty. I'm unhappy about that, but it still was the right thing to do. So I might be unhappy about the consequences of an action, but that's irrelevant to the morality of the action. What gives the, the, the act moral worth, it's not its consequences, right? It's the instantiation of honesty. Likewise, if I instantiate honesty, and let's say it does turn out that it creates more honesty, maybe I become, I don't know, a martyr or somebody, people go, hey, I admire that guy, I wanna be like him. Um, I might be happy about that and say, yay, I created more honesty in the world. That doesn't make my act of instantiating honesty in the deontological framework more moral or, or more, uh, uh, you know, more worthy, right? No, 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 no. Just it's the act itself that is recognizing the value of honesty. Wherever and whatever happens, don't determine the moral worth of the action. When it does determine moral worth, you're in a different game of uh, ethics. You're outside deontological. You're more in a teleological framework. So keep in mind, de deontologists can be very happy with results, but that's not why deontologists would behave in the ways they do. Um, that's different, right? So I can be the, the happy or the unhappy deontologist, but I would still do what is right, regardless of the consequences, whether they be ones I consequences I like or consequences I don't. That's not going to influence. So this deontological approach, remember the right is independent of the good um, or the right or is independent of the bad or however you want to think of it. The right is independent. Um, and uh, and so you just say, well, I, I hope that being, I would hope that being honest inspires more people to be honest, but so be it if it doesn't. Um, or I might say, no, 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 I'm not going to be a deontologist. I disagree with that whole approach. I'm going to act to promote honesty. I want more honesty in the world. That's where the way we should go. And in that sense, to value honesty, maybe in some situations to truly value honesty, says the teleological approach, not the deontological, the teleological approach says, no, 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 no. This is the wrong way of unpacking the notion of valuing honesty. The way to uh, value honesty is to promote it, to say, okay, honesty is a good, we want to bring about more uh, of that good in the world. We want more honesty in the world. You know what? In this situation, I'm not going to behave honestly. I'm going to behave in a way that promotes honesty and sometimes promoting a value, er, er, like valuing a, pers a particular value, promoting. To value is to promote. And sometimes promoting it might be instantiating it. Fine. But I instantiate it because it promotes it, um, in, whereas it's different than uh, uh, valuing it as as uh, valuing it in and of itself, right? It's a subtle difference, but I value through promoting. Promoting is what dictates my actions, right? Because I'm trying to bring about more honesty all the time because I see it as a good. So promoting, uh, it, it's important to separate kind of this notion of valuing for its own self and promoting, right? In this sense, um, uh, uh, you, you, you're, you're trying to always think of uh, promoting in terms of the teleological, that's primary, right? So valuing is ultimately rooted in promoting, whereas valuing is not rooted in promoting here. Re valuing is rooted in instantiating. So instantiating versus uh, promoting. Subtle difference, but try to wrap your head around it. It's critical. Um, so in this sense, the right, that is in the teleological sense, the right does depend on the good. What's the right thing to do? Well, what good are you trying to bring about? Trying to bring more, more, more honesty. Oh, okay. Well, then act in a way that brings about more honesty. Well, sometimes acting in a way that brings about more honesty, that promotes honesty, might be 
not being honest, right? So you could say, look, I want more people to speak truth to power, but I'm not going to do it in this sense because that's going to lead to fewer people because they'll see me being punished for it. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty tricky game. Both of these ways are, are, are difficult when you really think them through. So, uh, but hey, ethics is <laughs> ethics isn't easy. And once you start going down the rabbit hole of really thinking about it, it gets even it gets even tougher. So now, with all this in mind, the question is, how should we uh, uh, value personhood? Right? Talk about that next lecture.